good afternoon, and uh, thank you for um, the invitation from the speaker or from the organizers to come here to this conference. So this is the third time I've been to this conference, and the last two times I gave a talk about genomic selection, which kind of skimmed over many of the topics of genomic selection. And this time I thought I would, I would go into a bit more detail on a particular topic that we're now working on in livestock breeding. And I do apologize that I am aware it is a planned conference. So. so with that in mind, I just thought, I think Mark had a slide that was quite similar to this one, so I just thought that I would present a slide that attempts to connect what I'm going to present to a possible plant breeding context. And in the future, we could imagine having a, plant, a typical plant breeding program could be split into a product development component and a population improvement component. The product development component would be quite typical or you know, quite similar to what is now standard, where you just make crosses and you do some trials, etc., uh, where you can just add some genomic data in, in, you know, in the way people are doing. Um, and that the phenotypic in information could, collected here could be fed into the population improvement to form the training set, which will be driven entirely off genomic selection, as many cycles per year as you can, and passing back parents to the product development step. And essentially, I, I would think this population improvement step would be almost identical to what animal breeders are doing in their recurrent selection breeding programs driven by genomic selection. So we could have a a total merit economic index, which would form the basis of our selection with multiple traits and multiple environments weighted within that optimally. We could introduce, utilize, and manage genetic diversity in an optimal manner and drive it all as fast as possible. So although the simulations I have are all in a livestock context, uh, they fit within, this context, within the population improvement context if that was to be adopted in plant breeding. So I come at this because genomic selection is now routine in the large uh, animal breeding programs as of the last two or three years. Uh, it has been, I think, quite successful. So accurate breeding values are possible. Generation intervals have been shortened, uh, which enables response to selection to be driven up quite a bit. The dynamics of how genomic selection works in theory and in practice are quite well understood. We have good systems, software, databases, genotyping platforms, etc., in place to deliver genomic selection routinely and cheaply. And I think most importantly for the future, breeding programs can now generate lots of genomic data and phenotypes. So for example, in the pig breeding program that I work with, we can generate 100,000 individuals a year with genotype information. Uh, and that's at current genotyping prices, and if the genotyping prices were to drop a little bit more, we could turn that 100,000 into a million animals a year quite easily. So, um, so in that context, uh, we're proposing now what we're calling genomic selection 2.0, which will be driven from sequence data. So we recognize that sequence data has huge potential in breeding programs, but I, I think, and, and I think others also agree, that to realize this huge potential, we need massive volumes of sequence data. Doing something with 100 or 1,000 sequenced individuals is not going to be of much use in a breeding program for driving genetic gain for complex traits. It may be very useful for other applications in research, for example, but for driving genetic progress, it will be of limited value. But if we had a million animals with whole genome sequence information, then we could do something radically different. And I think the economics of livestock breeding programs, and I also think large plant breeding programs, will be are such that by the end of the decade, we will have breeding programs with a million animals. For example, we have a project now in place where we're going to sequence, generate sequence information on 325,000 individuals. And with that sort of data, we might be able to do what we call industrial scale fine mapping, where perhaps 50% of the total genetic variance could be fine mapped to, Q, for, uh, to its direct QTN. And then with that, we could drive uh, greater genetic progress. So how would we do that greater genetic progress? Well, at the simplest levels, we could just do what we are doing today, but better with more, more higher accuracy so we could reach the asymptote of accuracy. Um, and the uh, persistence of that accuracy would be very high such that we could do what we call across breed predictions. So pig breeding programs, for example, have 6,000 individuals in the elite nucleus that sits at the top of a global breeding program. That feeds, that, the genetics of that is then fed into a multiplier layer which would have 170,000 sows. Those 170,000 sows then feed the, 100, the genetics into 100 million slaughter pigs globally. 
And at the moment, because of the, the limits of persistency of genomic predictions, we can only train and predict inside that 6,000 sows. But if we could have huge amounts of data, we would have these persistent predictions so we could train and utilize our genomic data in the multiplier layer and perhaps most importantly in the commercial layer. So you could imagine a situation where every pig in the US is feeding commercial phenotypes into uh, the breeding program. And as Sarah said on, on Wednesday, sequence-based genotyping is configurable so we can manipulate the costs as we require. So for selection candidates, we can have a very cheap genotyping platform. We're aiming at something at $6, for example. Or that same thing could be applied for commercial pigs where we're just essentially just using them to, to collect phenotypes. And then for more valuable individuals, like very important sires, we can crank up the quantity of information that we would recover and, and obviously the, the, the money we would spend on sequencing. So these would be kind of standard things that we could use uh, with, or we could achieve with sequence data, but we could also be bolder. So we could make explicit use of de novo mutations. And if we think about our pig breeding program that is producing 100,000 candidates, selection candidates a year, and if each of those candidates has 20 de novo mutations, that's 2 million de novo mutations that are feeding into our breeding program each year. Traditionally, when we were doing progeny testing of our sires in animal breeding, or when we were doing phenotypic evaluation in plant breeding, we were implicitly utilizing those de novo mutations. When we change to genomic selection, we do not have a way to capture information on those, or phenotypic information that pertains to those de novo mutations, and therefore we cannot select on them. So if we could come with a strategy that would enable us to bring back the power to utilize these, I think it would be useful. We could also manipulate recombination rate. So recombination rate is quite, we get small amounts of recombination in our individuals, which constrains the amount of genetic variation that is released in each generation. And you know, we are, that is a favorable thing for standard genomic selection because the accuracy of standard genomic selection depends on the correlation between markers and QTN. Uh, it needs to be high, we need high LD to make good predictions, but if we had predictions driven by fine mapping the QTN directly, would, we would no longer depend on these correlations. And then we could inflate recombination, not impinge our accuracy, and release the genetic variation faster. In this talk, I'm going to talk about using genome editing for complex traits, but there are other things we could do, such as putting in place systems to enable us to use the sequence data to rapidly respond to disease outbreaks, but broadly, much more precise utilization and monitoring of our genetic variation. So I guess now getting into the the aim of the talk more explicitly, so I'm going to talk about how we would use genome editing to increase the rate of genetic progress for complex traits. So genome editing is a process which enables us to precisely edit the genome, so you can get a molecular scissors and just cut the DNA at some point and then replace it with some other synthesized or otherwise derived piece of DNA. So we can have nucleotides that are added, deleted, or replaced. So I should point out that I, I am not in any way an expert in, in the molecular biology of genome editing, so I just treat it as a tool in the way that I treat a SNP chip as a tool. So my colleagues in Roslyn Institute uh, are among the experts in, in actually the molecular biology of, of genome editing, and, and they have recently developed what they're calling PIG26, which is getting a lot of media coverage in the UK, a bit in the way that Dolly got media coverage some years ago. Uh, so PIG26, uh, what they did was a single base deletion in the gene that confers susceptibility to African swine fever, and in theory now we have a pig that has resistance to African swine fever on the basis of this single base deletion. So while this has been a success, genome editing itself is still a technology that's in its infancy. So in this experiment, I think they, they had something like a 10 to 15 percent success rate of the pigs that they attempted to edit. And there is a problem with off-target editing, so you're, you end up not editing what you attempt to edit, but something downstream in the DNA. And, it, you know, I don't exactly know how much genome editing costs on a routine basis, but it is more expensive than a SNP chip, so we're not immediately ready to use it uh, routinely. But that said, uh, I think the zebrafish community now have a project in place where they're going to edit every single base in the zebrafish genome uh, by doing 10 edits in a given individual, and so cassettes of 10 loci, if you like. So that is an example that genome editing is possible to do in large numbers. So the focus of the application of genome editing has been on simple traits, so the African swine uh, fever 
trait. There has also been examples where they have edited uh, single genes that confer what we call double muscling in cattle. Uh, but while these are successes, they're not of massive value to the, to the breeding industry because the breeding industry, most traits of economic importance are complex, controlled by thousands of QTN, each with a small effect. So our question was, you know, could we use genome editing in this context and then how would we do that and what would the impacts be to other aspects of our breeding program? So we're calling this promotion of alleles by genome editing page. And from the, the perspective of a quantitative geneticist who thinks about genome editing as a breeding tool, it's basically just highly controlled recombination, which enables us to move variation that exists in our population around that population very freely, independently of any background haplotype effects or any other linked QTN. We can just move things around very quickly. So it, we don't have to wait for favorable permutations to arise, a favorable per permutations of alleles to arise. We can just impose those directly. We don't have to waste selection intensity on keeping those firm favorable permutations in place. We don't have to waste selection intensity on ed, uh, selecting those bigger QTN. We can just handle them with genome editing. And we don't need to have these bigger QTN domi dominating our GEBV. So the, the major statistical signal that comes into a GEBV is, lar is not largely, but is to some extent driven by small numbers of large QTN. And if we could just pull those out, genome edit them, and then we could let the GEBV wor worry about the, the remaining polygenic component, that might be attractive. So we have a simulation which is a standard recurrent selection scheme with some generic features and then some differences where we applied different genome editing strategies. So in all of the scenarios we have 10 generations of selection. In each generation we have 500 males and 500 females. Out of those 500 males we select 25 sire individuals to be the sires of the next generation and we select all females. The selection of the sires is on the basis of their true breeding value. So if you like, this would be genomic selection with perfect accuracy. We think this is valid because with 325,000 animals with whole genome sequence information, we will be close to perfect accuracy. And in any case, if we had a system that, was that would be able to fine map large numbers of QTN to give us the targets we require for genome editing, we, that in itself would drive perfect accuracy. So I, I think it's a fair comparison, albeit a little bit unrealistic. So the traits we simulated, one, they were both highly polygenic. One had 1,000 QTN, uh, the other with 10,000 QTN with the effects coming from a normal distribution, so no large effect QTN. And then the selected sires were edited using different strategies. So th the strategies we used to edit the sires were constrain the number of edits per selected sire. So we have 25 selected sires and we could edit them for a number of alleles between 0 and 100 alleles. Then we could constrain the number of edits per generation. So it's in a situation where I have a fixed amount of editing I can do in a given generation, and then I can distribute that fixed amount of resources across my sires. So some sires getting edited, some sires not getting edited, for example. I can also edit different portions of the sires. So I can edit all my sire selected 25 selected sires. I can edit the top number of those selected sires the, or the bottom number of those selected sires. So when we were choosing the QTN for editing, again, we assumed the QTN effects were known, which would be valid if we had big data. Uh, and then what we did was we looked at the sire and found the largest N QTN that it was not already fixed for the favorable allele and just fixed him for the favorable allele for the largest, you know, 5, 10, 20 alleles. But while this is a little bit unrealistic, it is important to remind that these are polygenic Gaussian effects, with, which mean we don't have huge QTN. So visually, the strategies would look like this. We have genomic selection only. Then we have a set of scenarios where we have GS plus page with a restriction on the number of edits per sire. So we can edit the 25 selected sires for 1, 5, 10, or 20 QTN. We could edit the top 10 sires for 1, 5, 10, 20 QTN, or the bottom 10 sires. Then we can have GS plus page with a restriction on the number of edits per generation. So again, we can say we have uh, 125, 250, or 500 edits per generation, and those can be distributed across, um, for example, five sires. So these numbers were not chosen randomly. They were a little bit based on the idea that the, the, the zebrafish community are, are editing 10 loci in each of the individuals, and we thought, you know, 10, 20 is a, is a reasonable number to choose. So our comparison metrics are response to selection, 
the change in the allele frequency of our QTN, the number of distinct QTN being edited, and that is important because if we have a situation where we need to edit hundreds or uh, hundreds of thousands of, or tens of thousands of QTN to achieve good response to selection, that would be infeasible. But if we were only editing a small number of hundreds of QTN across our generations, then that is something that we could actually do because we could find those QTN using our, our data set. And then we study the impact of inbreeding. Uh, different strategies have different impacts on inbreeding and that is important because we want to conserve and utilize our genetic variation in, in an optimal manner in the long term. So some results. So we have here the genetic gain in standard deviations of the trait across our 10 generations. The blue line at the bottom will be uh, no editing, so that's just genomic selection with perfect accuracy, and then we increment one edit, uh, five edits, 10 edits, 20 edits. So for the trait with 1,000 QTN or 10,000 QTN in both situations, adding a small amount of genome editing really does have a big impact on response to selection. So here, for example, we are more than doubling response to selection by doing 20 edits. So I think it suggests that genome editing is complementary to genomic selection and could be useful. So then we said, well, let's think about editing a portion of the sire. So supposing we couldn't afford to edit all our sires, but just 10 of our selected sires, for example, how much of our delta G or response to selection would we recover under that circumstance? Again, the blue line is genomic selection without any editing. Uh, the purple line is editing all sires. I think this was for 20 alleles being edited. And then if we chose the uh, top or bottom 10 sires, we would achieve most of the genetic gain that we could achieve if we were editing all of the sires. So it was a little bit surprising to us that the editing the top or the bottom sires gave the same response to selection across these 10 generations. And it turns out what's, it's, it's quite interesting because by editing only a portion of the sires, what we are, so when, first of all I should say, when we are selecting 25 sires, they contribute equally uh, progeny to the next generation. And if we edit those 25 sires, they still contribute equally to the next generation. But if we um, edit a subset of those sires, they contribute equally to the next generation, but their progeny disproportionately contribute to the following generation. So in effect, what we're doing is creating super grand sires, which dominate our, uh, our second to next generation. And, and essentially, whether you are the bottom or the top, uh, sires, it doesn't, uh, that gets edited, it doesn't matter, you are the guy that's going to contribute the grand progeny. And uh, that doesn't seem to matter for making genetic progress, but it does make a big difference in, in inbreeding, which we will see later. Uh, so fixing the total number of resources per generation. So again, um, this is response to selection, this is uh, generations, 1,000 QTN, 10,000 QTN. The blue line is genomic selection on its own. Uh, the purple line is editing all of the sires or focusing the editing across all of the individuals. Uh, and then these two lines are focusing the edits on, this, uh, focusing a fixed amount of resources on a, on a smaller number of individuals. So in this case, we have 500 edits, which we could distribute across all 25 or only distribute those 500 edits across five sires. And we get a major bump in the response to selection by focusing the editing on a smaller number of individuals, but as we will see, it does impact inbreeding later. So what is driving the extra response to selection that we are getting from our genome editing strategies? So we looked at that, we tried to understand that by looking at the changes in allele frequencies across our 10 generations. So this is the frequency of our QTN or the average frequency of our QTN in, in each of the generations. So, um, if we take uh, no editing, the blue line, uh, for our, this is the trait with 10,000 QTN, and we look at the solid lines, which is all QTN, and then the dotted lines, which is, are only the 20 QTN with largest absolute effect. So the, if you like, the bigger QTN versus all QTN. With uh, standard genomic selection, we are making response to selection, but we're not really seeing massive changes in the average allele frequency across, this, across time. Um, for the larger QTN, we do see that genomic selection on its own without any editing does increase the allele frequency of the larger QTN a little, uh, let's say noticeably. But with genome editing, 
uh, of these larger QTN, we're getting a massive uh, increase in the frequency of favorable alleles extremely quickly. And it is this uh, drive to fixation of the larger QTN that is driving the extra response to selection that we're getting from, from applying small amounts of genome editing. So we then looked at uh, the number of distinct QTN that we would edit across our 10 generations and the correlation between adjacent generations, if you like, and uh, the overlap between QTN that are being edited in different generations. And this is important because, as I said earlier, if we have to edit 10,000 QTN to achieve good response to selection, that is probably infeasible. But if we only had to edit 200 QTN, we could probably manage that. So this was a scenario which we had 10,000 QTN controlling the trait. We were editing 20 edits per selected sire, and all of the 25 sires were being selected. So this would be a simple idealized scenario, if you like. Um, across the 10 generations, we only edited, and across 10 replicates, so that's why it's, it's a 0.5, uh, we only edited a total of 162.5 distinct QTN. So these distinct, these 162.5 distinct QTN explain only 12.5% of the, the population, the base population genic variance, if you like. So um, we think that mapping such a, a number of QTN which explains such a portion of genetic variance is, is uh, possible within the, the scope or within the, the populations that we plan to construct. So for example, in the human GWAS studies with 100,000 individuals, I think they were able to find 184 QTN that was explaining 10% of the heritability. So these numbers are not too different to, to those, uh, those studies. And we will have 325,000 pigs, and we would argue that pigs are far more amenable to finding QTN and unraveling quantitative traits than, than human data sets. So the story is that genome editing does help drive genetic progress, but we need to be very careful because it does have a major impact, in, or the strategy with which you do your genome editing has a major impact on inbreeding. And if you do a lot of inbreeding, you utilize your genetic variation very quickly. And if you utilize your genetic variation, you can't make subsequent response to selection. So it's a, something we, with use of genome editing, we need to be very careful. So if we look at the, uh, the blue line down here, or, or yeah, the blue line is, that's standard genomic selection with, with no editing. Then if we apply the, re the red line would be s standard genomic selection plus 20 edits per selected sire, and we were editing all sires. So under these circumstances, we were not creating these super grand sires, which is why the rate of inbreeding between the two schemes is identical. So subs you know, the, the, the uh, selected individual is, is contributing approximately the same amount of grand progeny to the future generations, and therefore we are not disproportionately utilizing some families. But if we edit, if we focus on the yellow line where we're focusing our equal number of edits only on five sires, so 20 sires being unedited, those five, we, we end up with quite a big jump in, in inbreeding, and that is because we're producing these super sires which utilize and exhaust our genetic variation. So the, the message is we need to be extremely careful with how we use genome editing in our breeding programs. So my conclusions are that PAGE is uh, very effective for increasing genetic gain in breeding programs. Uh, to utilize it, we don't need to find map huge numbers of QTN less than 200 that explain less than 15% of the base population genic variance is probably possible within our planned data sets. So we can begin to utilize, think about how we might utilize this genome editing technology in our breeding programs. Uh, there are some risks if the, if the system is not properly managed. So the biggest from a, the perspective of a quantitative geneticist will be inbreeding. There's also a problem of target identification. So really we need to does GWAS get us the actual causal variant, or does it get us approximately close to the causal variant? And what extra things do we need to do to achieve that? Uh, genome editing is itself not a perfect technology, and it can have off-target editing, so in, in editing you know, downstream of your target, which at best have uh, no impact, but at worst could be toxic. Uh, for practical use, I think we need to get and assemble huge data sets. We need to have a good strategy for identifying targets, and obviously we need costs. So that is the, uh, my acknowledgments. I'd like to particularly acknowledge uh, my co-author, Yanis Yanko, who ran most of the simulations. Genus and Aviagen have been long-term funders of my research, 
and, and Yanis was partly funded by ICRISAT also, so we, we acknowledge that. Um, so I apologize that this was a livestock talk, but uh, two years of, I tried to do two years of trauma. So. Dr. John will be happy to answer some of your questions, maximum three questions. Three questions. I have a, first of all, that was a really fun talk. Thank you. I have a nomenclature question, and depending on how you answered, I'm going to have a quick follow up. So you said um, you edited to fix favorable QTN. Do you mean fix in a genetic sense, or do you mean fixes in repair? Can you be more explicit exactly what you mean there? You said edit, edited to fix favorable QTN. So are yeah. you making it homozygous with yeah. the favorable? Yeah. So the genome editing technologies I'm aware of act independently on the two homologous chromosomes, so getting that is not possible at any reasonable probability unless you're working with the heterozygotes. So in the pig study, the pig 26, so they had they did 500 embryos, okay. 55 were edited, 15% uh, survived. If I remember correctly, it was 10 of the individuals were... Double hits? Uh, double hits, and five were heterozygotes. Okay. Chair, the genome editing will replace GMs. And another question is, among Tolan and CRISPR case 9, which is more specific and robust? So, so I'll answer the first question, but I didn't hear the second question. So, so I, I think genome editing is really attractive uh, technology because it is, it is less antagonistic to, let's say, um, interested people that are not working in this field. Um, I don't know what word you use to describe those, uh, in that we are essentially taking genetic variation that exists in our population and moving it around our population very quickly. And so we're not bringing in anything novel from some other species that is antagonistic or whatever. So the second question I didn't hear. Yeah, uh, this is G uh, genome editing techniques, pollen and the CRISPR case 9. Two techniques are there, no? You know, no. So, genome editing techniques, pollen and CRISPR case 9. Among these two techniques, which is more specific and robust? So, as I said, I'm not an expert in genome editing techniques, but my co-authors tell me CRISPRs are the way to go. Yeah, under the regulations passed in the state of Vermont in uh, US, the genome editing will be considered, organisms will be considered as uh, GMOs and they will have to follow all the regulations. What is it uh, under the European uh, regulations? So, again, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, what yeah, I can say... Will, will they be considered as genetically modified organisms? I, I, I don't know, yeah, yeah. But, but what I can say is... So, you, you, they will have to go through all the regulations and... Uh, th there is a shift in... Yeah. yeah. There, there is a shift in, I, I sense that there is a shift in the acceptance of this type of technology in Europe. Uh, well, the shift is uh, very slow. <laughs> because the combinant technology is used, even if you are not inserting a transgene, it will be treated as a GMO. It will be genetically modified. Okay, uh, we, uh, sorry, we will have to close it and, uh, huh? okay, you want to answer, please, just the last one. Uh, yeah. uh, I represent a small enterprise which developed completely new gene editing technology which doesn't generate any uh, double-stranded break and uh, 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 work in very, very uh, mild specific way to generate a combination. We are aiming at editing of approximately three to five traits at the same time. Yeah? So regulation in European Union is moving a little bit in more relaxed uh, um, uh, direction because there is uh, the law under consideration how many base pair is allowed to change into genome so that we could call it as a GMO. And from another side, up to today, the European Union considered the law that chemical mutagenesis should be considered also as GMO. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, we thank Dr. John Hickey for his nice presentation.